Good morning, how's everyone doing today? Good? Um, if you don't already have your headphones on and you can hear me, go ahead and put them on because that's how, because there's no external speakers, so y'all won't be able to hear me without the headphones, not from way back here at least. Um, if you do have any problems with the sound during the session, please uh, let me know or, and then, or let the back sound guy here know he'll, and he'll take care of us. Um, and then we'll get you another headset um, so that way you can hear. Um, so welcome to IoT 101. We're going to be talking about um, basically how to get started with um, IoT, um, how that fits into application, software development, how you can um, work with uh, devices and protocols and things like that. Um, I'm going to cover about as much as you need to get started in about 45 minutes. And then I'll also actually towards the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Dev DevNet certifications, which we cover. Uh, DevNet now has their own IoT certification. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so just to kind of get us, oh, is this? There we go. Sorry. Thank you. Um, to get us start, I'll start with uh, my pinnacles of IoT. Um, I did forget to introduce myself. I'm Jock Reed. I know it says Christopher Reed on the session, but my middle name is Jock. I go by Jock. I'm the lead developer advocate over IoT technologies for DevNet. Um, so I work with all the IoT BUs within Cisco um, across a lot of their product lines. There's other. There's two other developer advocates in IoT besides me, um, and that would be Shweta and Florian, and they're here as well, and they have sessions that you should definitely go see. Um, but we'll talk about what I would consider my pinnacles of IoT, and we'll go through that. Um, so it would be data, connectivity, protocols, edge architecture, which is, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the software there, and even um, the devices themselves, visualizing your data, and then software development. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about security. I know security is a big um, thing that everyone's concerned with with IoT, so we'll have a, a little bit of conversation around that. Um, and then we'll talk about like I said, the DevNet certs and other DevNet goodness as we go along. So my pinnacles of IoT. So I've kind of broken up what I consider the main functions of IoT um, based on what I think are most important. There's a lot of other things you can get into um, beyond what I'm saying are the most important things here, but these are kind of the big ideas that I think you can branch off into other areas of developing applications, solutions, um, deploying devices, that type of thing. Um, it all kind of starts here before you get to anything else. So data. So IoT is really just about data, if you really think about it. All it is is we're trying to collect data from a lot of different sources and do something with that data. It could be we're just monitoring that data. We could be um, creating actions on that data, um, that type of thing. But we're absorbing data from a lot of different places. Uh, and we have been for a long time. But really, if you think about it, up until like the last decade, 15 years, we haven't really been doing a ton with that data. We're doing now more with that data than we ever have been or we're trying to. Um, and so that in and of itself creates challenges. How do you... Um, how do you use that data? How do you create actions against that data? That type of thing. Um, and I know that seems like a revolutionary idea for any kind of software development. Oh, something's about data. So I know I just blew your socks off with that one, but it really is. It's, um, I think in my mind, a lot of people think of IoT as something that's this big daunting thing, but it's really not much different than anything else we've ever done in software or devices that we haven't already been doing. We're just doing it with more instead of what we have been in the last 50 years. And that's really the only difference. And that's kind of my, my main point of uh, kind of like this part right here. This makes it simpler, easier to understand, um, easier to get into, that type of thing. So really for it to become the Internet of Things, you got to have connectivity. Um, because if, you have, if you're collecting all this data, but you're only collecting it at source, then how is that helping you? So how do you collect that data? How do you connect that data? Um, the way to be able to do that is you use the network. Um, for Cisco, that's bread and butter for them, right? Is we put the devices on um, either certain types of protocols, so we connect them to um, public-private internets, we connect them over various wireless standards, could be Bluetooth, Zigbee, LoRaWAN, 
um, could be um, lo-fi, that type of thing. There's a lot of other protocols out there that exist as well. Um, but the main point of all those protocols is to get you to um, get that data from one point to the other. Now it could be in a private data center, which would be like your private cloud, or it could be up to the cloud. It could be for edge computing purposes um, and other por portions of your network or that kind of thing, um, depending on how you're able to um, process that data or your use case, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about that even when we get into edge architecture. Um, but the main thing about this is that you really need to be able to connect to the data for it to be valuable. Otherwise, what are you going to be able to do, that, um, do with that? And so I always give this as an example. Um, this is an old luxury car in, car in the United States. It's a 2000 Buick. Um, and then I have this comparison um, with the uh, Tesla here. So the biggest difference between these two vehicles are, besides this being electric and this being gas, and this has like a touch screen in it and this doesn't, they have a few of those different features. But if you look at the data, what's coming off the CAN bus, from the engine, from the rotational speed of a timing belt or the temperature of the engine block or whatever, that's all the same information that would be collected in a newer car. The only difference is if you have a problem with the computer on this device or you need to repair that, you have to bring that into the dealership. If you have a problem with the computer on this, they can update that remotely. That's really the power of connectivity for the Internet of Things is before is it gives you better customer experience. It gives you better production value, that type of thing. So you can do updates to this vehicle, even when you find things that are wrong or defective with the computer here, you have to bring this car into your dealership or bring it into your manufacturer, that type of thing. With this, you can um, basically fix your device remotely. And this really is applicable to a lot of other industries as well. Like one of, one of our main partners that we were highlighting last year, they're able to do this with utility companies. They're able to connect what they originally were doing as a hardware firmware. They're deploying an application to a Cisco device and they're monitoring electric utilities. And they'll be able to do that and update the software remotely. And so they never have to send a tech out to um, install the device ever again. And so that's actually, or even update the firmware or do things like that. They can, they can have the customer do that and then they manage it remotely for them. And so that's the big power of that connectivity part. That said, getting into IoT protocols, and there are quite a bit. I, I'm mentioning a few here. These are kind of um, just a few of the big ones I'm kind of bringing up here, but you have um, your basic types of transport. So you have Wi-Fi, wi Bluetooth. We kind of talked about that in the connectivity part. Um, that's how you're getting the data from one place to other. That's how the connectivity ties into it, a wire, that type of thing. Then you have the different data protocols. So at this point, this is where we're connecting, where we're pushing the data across these connectivity points across the network. How do we do that? Um, typically, we do that over HTTP, which is going to be your best basic APIs, RESTful APIs. Um, but the problem with that is it tends to be heavier. Then you have WebSockets and MQTT, AMPQ, even XMPP in some cases. Um, and there's uh, some other protocols in there as well. But um, when you start getting into these, you start getting into lighter weight um, protocols that allow you to transport the data fast over constrained environments. Um, and so those are real important. We still use the APIs over HTTP connections, but um, typically we're going to use WebSockets and MQTT. And that's going to be um, how we get the data from either one device to the next device or even a device to a web application that type of thing. We're going to use the lower overhead protocols like MQTT and WebSockets. Um, but once again, depending on your use case, you might still use other protocols as well. Um, and then there's also industrial st standards and protocols like MT Connect, Open PLC for communicating to your devices. This is more for obviously serial connections, this type of thing. Um, but being able to take that and communicate it back over the data protocols and then transporting that data. Um, and then you have data constructs. Um, a lot of what we're seeing now is you'll see a lot more JSON and XML, although sometimes, depending on the manufacturer or the device, you might see YAML, you might even see plain text. Um, you have a lot of different protocols uh, for that as well, and so you might see a lot of different formats once you start getting over different devices. 
Um, then you have brokers which tie into the data protocols like MQTT and WebSockets. Those typically are brokers combined together, then RabbitMQ for AMQP, and there's other brokers as well. Um, and there's quite a few protocols, so, um, but I don't want you to stress out about that because there are a lot and there's a lot to remember. And just in general about IoT, there's a lot that you could stress out over. But just kind of the big thing with this is to be calm. Don't try to be an expert in everything because I know a lot and I'm an expert in some things, but I'm not an expert in everything that's IoT. If I have to go through a certain industry that I'm not as familiar with and help them solve a solution, I will bring someone with me that's more, a more expert in that area. So one of the things, and I'll, and I'll reiterate this a little bit later on, is when you're doing IoT, make sure to take partners. Um, you're coming to DevNet, you're learning the programmability, you're learning how to do applications, you're learning to do all that. Um, just take it one step at a time and try to solve the problem. And so getting into that, this is where we talk about edge architecture. Um, and for me, this is, the, this is kind of the fun part of IoT right here, because then we get into what do we do with that, with that data? We've, we've got the protocols, we can, we've got how we're gonna connect to it, but all the different ways, but how do you connect to it? What, what, how do you push the data? What networks do you push it over? Do you use um, a, a non-standard wireless gateway that connects back to your network to be able to connect to your devices? How do you even assess that type of thing? And so the, um, being able to architect it, being able to figure out, um, is your application going to be edge to cloud, edge to your DC? Is it going to be just edge devices? Um, how, how does the connectivity f uh, factor into that? Um, how much edge compute resources are you going to have there? I mean, this could be really big for you. Uh, do you have just enough compute that that's exists in a Raspberry Pi and Arduino? Do you have machine learning applications um, where you are and you're at the edge and you're manufacturing or your um, retail environments, that type of thing. Like, what are you doing? So we got to figure that out and architect that out. Um, and then how do we get the applications to those devices? That type of thing. Cisco's got a lot of solutions for that, but so do other people. Other people have solutions for that too. Um, and then there's, how does the cloud fit in that? And that gets into an even bigger discussion is you're processing the data at the edge, you're doing something with it, but how do you analyze it further? How do you do deeper learning on it? You really do still need the cloud. And as much as even Cisco pushes edge compute and a lot of other companies are pushing edge compute right now, um, you still need the cl cloud as a big complement. There's not gonna, edge is not gonna take away from what cloud is doing, it's actually gonna enhance it. It's gonna make it better. And so you're gonna see these two sides as big partners with each other. You're gonna see cloud applications that push that that's where you do your machine learning, um, the act building the models, but then you're pushing the application down to the edge. You're gonna see a lot of that in your applications for being able to do that. And so, depending on how you wanna architect that, it's gonna really depend on your industry. Here's just a few industries right here, but um, they all have different needs. And so being able to connect back is actually, um, and we'll figure out how it is that you do uh, get your data and connect it back to the network to your data center, uh, that type of thing is gonna depend. So like in this example, this is an oil rig. Well, most of the edge um, applications in IoT are gonna live, or I mean all the applications in software, a lot of that's gonna live right here because the connectivity out where it, it's at is very constrained. Even if they are able to connect back to your source network, you still need to go long periods of time without having to have cloud processing. So you need to have extra compute resources here, right? versus a city center. A city center, a lot of city centers um, are on the backbone of a network, especially large cities like Barcelona or New York City or London or wherever. Um, they're gonna be on the backbone of the network, so connectivity at the edge, having a lot of edge compute resources in like a traffic cabinet is not as necessary. You can have those edge resource, you could have those application resources and compute resources more central in your data center or even push back to the cloud so you can have less resources at the edge here than you can there. And the other thing is maybe you're not using wireless standards, maybe everything's connected, maybe there are some wireless sensors here, but maybe a lot of it is connected over wired. Um, we didn't talk about that as much during connectivity, but that could be a big thing, is especially if you're connected in buildings and things like that, is maybe you don't go wireless. 
That's part of the edge architecture. That's how you figure it out is you, you look at the problem that you have. You might actually use the network to drive PoE connections to a device. So that way you have the network um, is connected to it over Ethernet, but you're also driving the power. So you only have one connection for the power there. You're not relying off a battery. You have constant power through the network. Um, that could be very reliable for something right here. Um, that said, is uh, we don't have manufacturing up here, but if you start getting into that, you might need wired there as well. A lot of wireless standards don't work very well in industrial manufacturing envir environments because the frequencies that exist in manufacturing actually prohibit the use of things like Bluetooth and Zigbee. Um, so you end up having to connect that kind of stuff. So th this is, in my mind, this is like the big fun part right here is figuring out what your solution is or what, sorry, what your problem is and then figuring out what the solution is for that. And so when you do that, you're actually just honing in on your problem and you're becoming an expert in that area. And that's really a lot of what IoT is as well. That's how even I've gotten a lot, my, a lot of my experiences. I've actually gone out to solve problems and that's where I go. And I, that's why I'm not an expert on every, every single thing that's in IoT. I'm an expert in some things, but not everything. But we have people on our team that are an expert on the things that I'm not an expert in. And so that's how we do take partners, that's how we solve applications, that's how we do um, the general stuff with that and IoT. <clears throat> so IoT devices. So I put all these kind of devices up here. So this is, uh, this is Cisco's IRA29. This is an edge compute device. Uh, you probably recognize that. That's a uh, Raspberry Pi. That's an Arduino. Um, that's a small ESP8266, um, excuse me, um, microcontroller. Um, and they have different functionalities. These relate more to each other as far as that type of thing goes. And this relates more, more or less to each other as far as the amount of compute resources. Um, but there are big differences between this. And I, I like to use this example because um, a lot of where IoT has come from, if you look at a lot of the big push, actually came from hobbyists and um, makers that were building app things like that before. I mean, a lot of people think IoT is like when the first thing that comes to mind is like the Nest or the like the remote you know thing that controls your temperature in your house, right? So that way I can do it from my app for anywhere, anywhere remotely. And then you think, well, that that's not applicable to my business unless you're a hotel chain, right? So if you're a hotel chain, maybe you're very interested in controlling the temperature in a lot of different rooms, especially when people aren't in those rooms. And so you want to be able to do that remotely, and so you connect to it, but you also got to be able to read the sensor data from those um, different places as well and be able to do something with it. So depending on your, um, your solution, you might use this over this. So maybe in a hotel environment, a device a little bit more robust than this, but a lot like this would be sufficient instead of using an edge device like this. And so, because Cisco doesn't, they don't have everything, so we fill the gaps with partners and things like that, right? So, but if you're in an industrial environment or you're in a vehicle, like a transportation, like you have a trucking company, or you want this in an industrial manufacturing environment, this device is gonna be all your networking, your cellular, um, you can connect other gateways to it that are using other protocols. It has compute where you can push applications to. This is how you push applications to that. Um, and so you have different devices and then you'll have different solutions that go along with those devices. That'll be part of the software and how you drive the, eventually how you drive the application. Um, but in the large part, a lot of this is fairly commoditized because you can, any of the devices, you just need a device that's gonna solve your problem. So you're gonna go into um, do I need a Raspberry Pi type advice or do I need this? And that goes back to the edge architecture. And so that's kind of why we covered it first. You have to have those other areas before you can even look at which device you're going to be able to deploy. So other parts of the device you have and things to consider when you're doing, before you even get into software application development are Depending on the type of device, you have to know what the CPU architecture is. That's going to that's going to depend on that's going to drive what's going to the programming language you're going to write for that application, right? Because you there's certain programming language there's certain if you're writing on a microcontroller, you might be confined to Python and C++ because they're not going to run Java or GoLang or Node.js in most cases. In some cases they will, but um, that type of thing. 
um, do you need a gateway? Do you need a single board computer? Um, these are the types of devices that we deploy depending on that, like I said, um, that edge architecture that we're developing to solve our problem. Um, but mainly it's, you, you want to use whatever the best tool for the job is. So remember, we're trying to solve for the solution in IoT. We're not trying to solve for um, a Cisco salesperson trying to sell you an IR829 that's going to do all these great things, but it's overkill for what you need. You need to put in what you need to be valuable um, for you and not burden you with a whole bunch of costs as well. Um, so now that we've covered how do we get the data, how we architect the data, um, or how we architect our, our solutions, um, how do we process that, how we connect it all together, the next thing is really what the, the, a big portion of is how do you visualize that data. And so um, being able to visualize your data is actually fairly important. And there's kind of, in my mind, a, a couple of methodologies for being able to do it is you need to be able to run um, visualizations on your data locally. And so like here's an example of a, um, a freeboard visualization. And basically what that allows you, it's, it's very lightweight. I can deploy it on edge devices. I can deploy it very quickly to be able to see my data. I can graph it out fairly quickly. It's very intuitive. Um, but I do that to be able to very quickly look at the data so that way I can see, even if something's connecting, is it working? Am I getting the data? Is the data readout's good? Can I trust it? I'm the one who knows the device because I'm the IoT engineer, right? Well, I, be, I gotta be able to see the data at some point because a lot of it is machine to machine. So we gotta be able to connect those, that data back to applications and being able to use visualization tools helps us with that. And that even helps us in the process of figuring out, do I need to automate this? If I'm getting these alerts, if I'm getting this kind of data, do I need to write other um, applications that go along with the visualizations of this data? And so visual, being able to visualize your data is very important for us as humans to be able to see and interact with it because you don't know how to solve a problem unless you can start seeing how it's coming in, um, being able to iterate over it, um, that type of thing. Um, so I gave an example of Freeboard, which you mentioned down here. There's also other examples like Grafana and Elasticstack. Um, I like those, those are open source tools. There's other tools that you can get that are proprietary. Um, but I typically like those because they're open source. I use them all the time in my development. Um, and so they're very good tools. They help you to visualize your data. Um, like I said, Freeboard you can deploy in the cloud, but you can, but you can deploy that mostly like in edge locations because like I said, it's very lightweight. It's very fast to deploy. Um, typically when you're doing Grafana and Elasticstack and other visualization tools like that, um, you will typically have them back in your data center. You will probably won't deploy them to an edge device. So at this point, this is getting the data back when you have it in the cloud, you're processing it, and you're visualizing it there. And so that's the other part is um, visualizing data on the fly is one thing. Visualizing data in a little bit more of a, um, a formal manner to be able to present that back to decision makers, people that are funding your project, that are funding um, the operation, being able to give visualizations back to them, um, these tools are really good for that. And that's how you would maybe create dashboards that they're gonna, that um, other people in the company are gonna use. Maybe they use that for sales data later on. Maybe they just use that to, um, for IT to be able to use that data further or um, whatever it is that they're gonna be using that for. So for IoT software development, um, so kind of what I was talking about with the, the, the difference of the devices, once you figure out which device that you're going to deploy to or what's going to be solve your needs, that's when you start looking into um, the different kinds of programming languages. Um, like up here, I mentioned Python is great. It actually works on a lot of microcontrollers these days. They actually have a um, version of Python called MicroPython. I typically go that route um, just because it makes my development faster. I could go and run um, C++ applications and that's fine as well. And there's a lot of code to help you with that too. There's a lot of examples on that. Um, but um, you can also write applications in various other platforms. If you have a lot of edge compute, you can do anything you want. I actually do write a lot of my applications in Golang as well for IoT <clears throat> and things like that. Um, the next part of it is uh, making sure that you build pipelines for your 
um, for your applications. I actually give another talk over, um, it's a little bit more Cisco-centric, but it's uh, CICD, or Continuous Integration, Continuous Development, or Continuous Deployment, sorry, um, for your applications, for your IoT applications, and it's on top of Cisco platforms. Whether you're doing this on a microcontroller or a fairly um, resource-intensive edge compute device, you're going to want to have the ability to DevOps that solution to be able to constantly update and integrate and to be able to um, push new code, updates, that kind of thing. Because that goes back to that example when I was talking about the difference between the connectivity of the different devices, right? When I was talking about the Tesla and the old Buick is you still need to do updates. You still need to make sure you're patching firmwares, you're patching security holes, that type of thing. And you got to do that on a continuous basis to make your product better. Um, and that's just the reality of even the networks like that these days. That's why we have courses on that type of stuff. So we definitely need that in our software development stack for IoT, and that's something to keep in mind. Um, using software best practices, I can't um, stress that enough. If you're going to do that, um, if you're going to get into doing IoT deployments, you need to you need to have a Git repository. You need to have checkouts. You need to have code reviews. You need to make sure that someone is looking at that type of thing. Um, it's very important that you do that, and also. I, I like, I've been stressing this recently just based on some uh, customer interactions I've had with some of this is make sure you involve your IT and your DevOps teams and your company if, if you have them there. Um, even if you're doing this, like you're coming to DevNet, you're learning how to um, code and do applications now and you're getting certs and you're revving up on this and even if you are becoming an IoT engineer, make sure you're partnering with those other sources um, because they may already be doing some of the things that you need and so you can just integrate with a lot of the solutions that way. And it reduces a lot of the complexity and problems later on, especially with IoT deployments. Since you have devices that you're actually managing, you want less problems, you want less friction. And so being able to work with IT and DevOps departments within your company to do that. Now that being said is if, you, if you're kind of like a, a few people team and you're DevOps and IT already, then you don't even have to worry about this. But um, I've just seen this come up a few times in um, my interactions with uh, some customers and I just can't stress it enough, please work with those teams. Um, and so we'll talk about security a little bit too. So security touches every aspect of IoT, right? And it touches all the pinnacles. So we got through all the pinnacles, we did that, great. But well, what about security, how does that apply? Well. Even when we were talking about the software just a second ago, best practices on software, you need to have that. That's, that's part of your security posture. Um, being able to um, monitor the devices from a network perspective, that's part of your security posture as well. So that goes into connectivity. That goes into the data itself. Can you trust the data? Do you have something analyzing the data? Um, I encourage you, we, Cisco's actually just released uh, CyberVision. Um, I'll do a plug, this is for the, one of the other advocates, his name is Florian. Um, he has a session on that uh, here in DevNet, this, uh, this Cisco Live. I encourage you to go um, uh, view that session because it's uh, very interesting on that case. But um, that said, is you, you got to be able to take security and bring it to all those different pinnacles and be able to manage all the different parts of the device. If you have a device out in the field, you have to physically secure that device. That's part of your security posture as well. If you have something living out and if you're dealing with a, a transportation department for a government and they have a cabinet that lives out on a highway somewhere, um, you don't want someone to break in and steal that equipment. How do you secure that? That's part of your security posture too because if someone can at physically access your device, then you've got a problem you got a major security problem because they can start hacking on your actual device itself. Um, so there's a lot of security that goes into that. It, this period of time is really not enough to talk about all the different security things that you could get into. But another thing I'd like to reiterate is um, one of the big things that you want to focus on is mitigation. So you have layers of security, but security for IoT devices becomes very costly because you end up having a lot of them. You have a lot of sensors, you have a lot of compute nodes, you have a lot of things out in your different environments. So <clears throat> one of the things to realize is that if you're partnering with legacy operations, like especially in manufacturing, they have devices that actually have Windows XP on them, 
I know that sounds crazy, but um, and actually my brother used to work as a machinist for a long time before he became a nurse. And one of the things like he had on that his machine for milling uh, machine parts was it was like Windows XP. Well, that was back 20 years ago, but those machines have a 30 year life and you're going to go put that on the network. And if you want to see something get hacked really fast, go get a Windows device, just a computer, put it on the public Internet and see how fast that gets hacked. It'll happen really fast. So how do you prevent that from happening if you're going to put this device that's still got 10 years of life and finance isn't going to buy you a new mill for your machine parts? Well, you use the network. You use a lot of the things that Cisco provides for managing that. You monitor everything in and out of that device because you're never going to secure a Windows XP device. There's not enough software you're going to be able to put on there to make it totally secure. So you're going to manage that through the network. You're going to not even let anyone know that it's on your network. And so, and then you're going to manage everything, um, anything that comes in and out of that device. So that way people are not um, impacting your manufacturing uh, uh, workflows, that type of thing. So a lot, of, a lot of security in IoT is, is mitigation um, because depending on your device, depending on the security of that device, you might have to use the network to help offset any um, security holes that might be on that device, especially when you can't buy additional security for it and you still want to connect it at the same time because of the business value. So making sure that you cover all the different aspects of IoT is real important. Um, and being able to make sure that you partner. And this kind of goes back to the, what I was talking about in software, making sure you partner with IT, making sure you partner with your DevOps departments, because they already have these security postures in place as well. And if you want your applications and your devices to be secure, you need to do it. You need to make sure that that's part of your strategy too, especially at, when you're deploying um, IoT solutions. So, now we get to the search part. I've covered all, everything with IoT, but I know this is just an intro course. Um, but one of the things that we've been working on really hard within DevNet is uh, actually, especially uh, myself and the other IoT dev advocates, we've been working on the certification. So a lot of the stuff I covered kind of briefly in there, um, there's courses that you can take for the certs to be able to learn um, all those different protocols and a lot more in depth and there's study material for that type of thing. Um, the DevNet IoT certification or all the DevNet certifications actually come out um, at the end of February, which is just a little over uh, or a little less than a month from now. Um, so by the time Cisco Live Melbourne rolls around, that's gonna be available. There's certs are gonna be available. You can already start um, registering for the classes for those certifications. Unless you feel like you um, can do it, you can actually go online, which we're gonna actually look at a little bit here. So let's see. So yeah, here's the site for the DevNet certification. So developer.cisco.com forward slash certification forward slash DevNet IoT. Here's all the, oh, that's, sorry, it's not showing. Hang on one second. There we go. Sorry about that. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, so we have the certifications. You can go to the developer at cisco.com to be able to find out how to um, learn about the certifications. Basically, a lot, a lot of what I've covered even here falls into a lot of these categories right here. Um, since it is a Cisco cert, the, there are very, there are a lot more Cisco centric um, principles in there for um, developing on um, Cisco platforms. Um, I had this course as a very general overview of IoT intro, um, but um, here we get into more of this type of thing, but you talk about edge compute, you talk about um, even open source software, compute analysis, a lot of that we talked about in the, um, the Cisco IoT network architecture, you talk about the protocols, connectivity, um, basically all the pinnacles I talked to is all covered in here, and then you have security at the end right there as well, and, um, even, and it, it talks about the different um, uh, Cisco products that help with that security of uh, IoT. Um, but getting the certification is, uh, is really beneficial for um, your companies to be able to have engineers that have that. So that way you know that they 
have the knowledge to be able to do IoT deployments, to be able to um, engineer IoT problems, to be able to develop that type of thing. Um, so uh, please visit that to be able to see that. Um, also, if you are looking at some of the other certifications, um, developer.cisco.com forward slash certification. Um, you can get information on all the different certifications. Um, the IoT cert falls into specialist, um, and then you have uh, the DevNet Associates, and then uh, to be able to get the DevNet Professional, you have to have uh, the DevNet Specialist and the DevNet Core exam um, combined to be able to do that. Um, we will have a future offering for the DevNet Expert exam, probably in all the same areas as the professional offering, so like IoT, that type of thing. Um, you can see if you, are, if you do have those certifications, how um, each of those compares to the traditional certifications from Cisco. Um, and also just, uh, we've also been reiterating very strongly that um, these certifications are not going away. Um, in a lot of ways, these are still going to exist and you're still going to have people on your team that have these certifications. Um, but these are more developer and application focused. Um, and these are things we've been working on really hard to get the um, certification, um, the exam out, the courses out, um, that type of thing. So please check that out there. Um, let's see. Um, also, DevNet, um, Barcelona, any other um, information you need about DevNet, um, please check that out here while we're here in Barcelona. Um, Susie Wee has her um, <clears throat> innovation talk this week, so please go to that. Um, here's a little bit more about the exam overview and the different, and these are the specific um, areas where they will be covering the IoT exam here. And this is the breakdown, you saw the percentages, and this kind of breaks down the specific of uh, here. What's also good is we have links for learning some of this stuff here for our um, different areas. So we have learning labs that go through um, some of these areas right here. And so they will help you with some of your studying and learning on that type of thing. So please visit that. Um, let's see. Also, um, Network Automation Exchange, we have IoT stuff there, DevNet Code Exchange. Um, these are places when, so we talked about developing applications and doing that type of thing. Um, we also have um, code that's already written, so if you need a solution that's already built on a Cisco platform, you can actually search for it um, here at Code Exchange or um, Automation Exchange and you can find a, potentially a solution with a Cisco product if you're looking for that specifically, and it's something that someone's already coded either from us or from the community of people that are already using it. And here's an example of one that actually uses um, the Elastic Stack for visualization, monitoring your um, Cisco IoT gateway products. Um, and here's the code exchange right here, and here's where you can use that to find code for different IoT projects, DS links, um, for EFM, that type of thing. MUD, um, there's even stuff for specifically for IOX, which is our application deployment um, software on our edge devices, that type of thing. So, There we go. Um, so now we're, we're wrapping up the session. Um, please complete your survey um, of this session. I really appreciate y'all attending this morning. Um, and uh, this helps us get better. Um, please fill this out. Um, and any feedback you have is very, uh, very helpful for us um, to be able to do this and get better. Um, so please do that. Um, also, if you want to continue the conversation, um, we have a WebEx Teams room. Um, please use that. You can, you can find that through your um, Cisco Live application. If you have any questions, anything you've thought about while we were having this, uh, um, uh, this session here, you can actually ask me in that session. Um, and also, I'll be available um, after this and throughout the week if you have questions. Uh, and also, I'm, I'm very interested to hear um, your edge compute re uh, 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 problems, anything that you're going to try to do or IoT deployments that you're trying to accomplish here. 
Um, if you have any use cases that you're using that you just need some help guidance getting started with, I'd be interested to talk to you about that. So you can always come find me. You can do it after this session or whatever. Um, but please um, do that. And then continue in education. Um, we have Meet the Engineers. So if you do need to schedule a one-to-one -one with me specifically, and we can go to a quiet room and we can talk. Um, we can do that this week. Um, but there's also workshops all around. Um, I, I have a CICD workshop, which actually goes along with my CICD talk um, I'm doing later this week. So if you want to see um, IOX um, with, CI, with uh, continuous integration and deployment, I'll do that. Um, Walk-in labs, and there's also related sessions. There's other IoT sessions. Um, please check out our IoT demo over here. Our IoT BU is actually, I got a, a CyberVision IOX demo right over here with a cool uh, manufacturing arm. That's pretty neat. Um, so just right on the other side of this wall over here, please go check that out. The Merco's over there, give him a hard time. Um, and then that's it. Thank you for joining. I really appreciate y'all being here and y'all have a great rest of your Cisco life.